What's up, everybody? Welcome to Conversation Piece with Patrick Armstrong. I am the titular Patrick, and this is a show where we talk about the missing pieces of the conversations we're already having. Shout out to all of our returning listeners, and a high five and hello to everybody joining us for the very first time. My guest today speaks hope and healing in a hurting world, matching high energy performances with hard hitting lyricism. As a kid in suburban Delaware, he found a vocabulary for racial identity and liberation in hip hop culture. He now tours extensively as a musical performer and public speaker, bringing a clear and urgent voice to stages around the country and the globe. It is an honor to welcome my friend, Jason Chu, to the show. What's good, Jason? Patrick, what's up, man? Hey, that was an extremely professional intro. We were like <laughs> spitting you. all that intro, man. I really, uh, you killed that, man. It's great to be with you. So we've had so many dope conversations, like even just as recently as what, like a month ago. Uh, so yeah. it's really exciting to be here on uh, on your platform, bro. Hey, I really appreciate that. Yeah, for everybody who may not know, um, Jason and I have had the privilege of connecting just randomly at Asian American events. And like for me, having just come into this identity and really this community over the last three years to not only have connected with someone like yourself, who I first heard of on Jerry Wan's podcast, Dear Asian Americans, who was one Love of those first OG guests on that show, um, to be able to not only meet you, but then to sit and have some of these conversations around like what it means to be Asian American specifically has been really important and powerful for me um, and a big privilege to be able to unpack that with someone like yourself. So it's a to not only be able to do that, but then to be able to, I think, call you a friend in this space, oh, yeah. I think is uh, a really, really cool thing. And especially just, you know, on this accelerated journey that I find myself on, um, a really humbling and again, big privilege and honor. So the fact that you're here right now, I'm excited to be able to dive into this conversation. Um, for anybody who may not know who you are that's listening right now, do you mind sharing just a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, of course. So, you know, what's up, everyone? Uh, my name is Jason Chu. I'm a Chinese American rapper, activist, and educator. Uh, I stay out here in Los Angeles, California. Uh, but I was actually born in Chicago and I grew up in New England. So one of the things that I'm super passionate about is when we talk about Asian America, right? What are we actually talking about? Because we have so many people, I think, especially over this last, I'd say of the last 30 years, these last three years, you've seen a lot more voices, right? Talking about Asian American this or ANHPI that, but something that really moves and motivates me is, are we actually reflecting the diversity of our communities? Are we actually talking about Asian American experiences, the diversity, the breadth, the, the different backgrounds and lived experiences of Asian America? Or are we just projecting our own kind of like personal narrative, personal experiences onto everything else? And of course, our personal experiences matter but something that moves and motivates my storytelling, whether that's in the music that we've done, whether that's in the, you know, the, the speaking and, and the public activism, the public education that I do, is talking about, you know, Asian America talks about representation so much, but do we know what we're representing? Do we know when we step out as Asian Americans the community, the multi-generational community, the history that we're carrying out with us? Or are we just saying like, hey, I personally need to be seen, uh, which is great, which is great if you do. But, you know, like, what are we talking about here? So anyway, that's that's a lot of the work I'm doing. That's what this new project's about. That's why I'm so stoked always to talk with you, man, because I feel exactly like you're saying. You've been going on your own journey of owning and being a public Asian American voice and face. And I think like we just talked about a month ago, what you're bringing to the table needs to be a part of the Asian American conversation. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I do, man. I try to be part of those combos. I appreciate that. And I love those questions specifically. Are we reflecting the diversity of our communities? And do we know what we're representing? I think you name a really important thing of, are we like, do we understand the history? Or are we just projecting our own personal stories? And while it's really important for us to understand that personal narrative that we bring, because that's usually our entry point into these larger conversations of community and uh -huh. diaspora, 
once we start to unpack and understand our own personal story, are we doing the deeper work of understanding our place within that larger fabric? And I think these questions and what you bring up on the album are really important in terms of digging into that deeper history. Because if we don't understand our history, then we can maybe misrepresent our, our even where our own individual stories and narratives end up in terms of that bigger, larger, wider fabric. Um, before we jump into the album, I want to ask you, how did you get into specifically this kind of conversation? I love that you work in the, not only the entertainment space as a rapper, as a musician, as a creative, but also from an educational space, from an educational lens. How do you, how did you get into one or the other? And then how do you marry both of them? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the real answer, the short answer is just, I'm super nerdy. You know what I'm saying? Like anything <laughs> I do, I'm going to, I'm going to overthink. I'm going to overanalyze. I'm the sort of dude that I, I can't go halfway. You know, mm. I'm going to be real. This is why I'm not into sports because I know if I okay. got into sports, it would, it would take everything <laughs> because, you know, like I'm not the guy who like is a casual fan of something. Um, so, so for me, you know, what it was, was when I started reading into Asian American history, when I started getting involved in sort of like justice, social justice, activism, community, um, I did the deep dive, you know, I, I could never just be like, hey, here's this thing that impacts so many people's lives. Here's uh, a story or a historical fact that if you know it, you know, like learning about Chinese exclusion, learning about Japanese American incarceration, learning about the way America illegally annexed Hawaii, right? The kingdom of Hawaii, learning about the, uh, the adoption industry, right? And, mm. and what drives it. You can't like learn a little bit about it and then be like, cool. All right, man. But I'm gonna just go back to my regular life. It was dope. Like, you know, learning a right. little bit about these things that have impacted our community and still do. And so what it, really was too was out for me hip-hop and asian american identity and justice have always like linked together in my mind because for me hip-hop music is the first place that i really heard people talking their talk you know like pop music film and tv growing up everything i saw was created all of the pieces of entertainment i saw were created to cater to someone else's expectations mm. right the mainstream gaze the white gaze yep. and hip-hop was the first thing i encountered as a suburban kid in delaware that said no 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 we're not gonna we're gonna make things and if you want to consume them you're welcome to consume them but we're not gonna make them for you right and i think that that is what people have gotten really confused, right? Yes, NWA, Tupac, Run DMC, who became their primary consumers. Yes, it was white suburban kids, but the difference was they did not create asking, what do these white suburban teens want to see? Right. They created saying, what do I need to say? The fact right. that it resonated with Asian kids, white kids, rich kids, you know, like not people who don't speak English, that the fact that it resonated with everyone else, that was what came from the passion, the art, the authenticity. It wasn't what drove the creation. Right. And so for me, hip hop and my Asian American journey have always gone hand in hand because mm. I would not know how to pursue a racial identity, uh, with authenticity if it weren't for growing up in hip-hop i love that i think that hip-hop especially the way it resonates with folks specifically outside of the black community is it just goes to show how intersectional all of these things are and our, all of our communities are and like you said you know it wasn't specifically created for us it was created because it was a need for that community in terms of expression and that expression permeated outwardly and reached other communities, other pre peoples, other identities that were like, oh, shit, like 
this is something that I can vibe with too. And it was a way for us to then enter into our own versions of expression to find our own ways, not to appropriate the expression mm-hmm. and creativity, but to remix it almost in a way and to creating our own versions of expression. So I love that. I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's super helpful context for this conversation we're about to have because you just dropped a new album. We were the seeds. I think Sir. available everywhere, if I'm not mistaken, available wherever you get your music. What was the impetus for this particular album and what conversations are you hoping that this album generates? Yeah, so this album, man, like honestly, it's it's just a reflection of who I am today in my journey. You know, like where I've arrived at and I'm honestly, I'm actually really happy to be who I am today. Mm-hmm. And this record and these songs I wanted being on it it all comes out of that kind of rootedness of like, man, you know, I've been a public artist. I've been putting my voice on record. I've been putting content out for, you know, like 10 years now. And there's people who've seen me go through this whole journey of, you know, starting out, it was very much, I had some things I wanted to say and, and I also needed to be heard. There was, there was something, I, you know, in my twenties, like, man, those things I needed. Now that I'm in my thirties, now that I've had the life experiences I have, now that I have the community that that has been built around me, that I've been blessed with, these friends who are all on their own journeys, I'm so happy to be where we are. You know, like I, I always think about like if you told like Jason circa 2012 what life would look like 10, 11 years down the road, I'd be like super jazzed because so many things. Obviously, the world is is not in the best place right now, but in terms of knowing my place and being around people who are grounded and rooted, know their identity, know their place, know where they come from, know what they're trying to do. We're in such a good place right now. Um, so really, this album sort of is a reflection on on that rootedness, on on really feeling like over the last 10 years of being a rapper, being in LA, moving in Asian American community, I've seen my roots go deeper and I feel like I'm more tapped into where we come from. And and that's something I want to share with others, whether that resonates with them, whether that's something they're still looking for, um, to give them a picture of what that could look like. I really love that. I think that is that rootedness is like reflected directly in the title. You know, we were the seeds. It's like the product, this album, is that reflection of what was grown not only 10 years ago, but again, and throughout the whole history of this community. Something that stuck out to me as I was listening was the construction of the writer's room, I guess, of who like helped put the songs together. And I noticed that it wasn't just you. It was oh, yeah. like there were a bunch of people here that helped put this together. And it just, again, it just took me back to this idea of community. Can you talk a little bit about that formulation of song and songwriting and what it means to for you to craft songs together in community with other folks? Yeah, no, I, I love having a team around me. Like I always tell younger artists, like who ask me for advice in this music thing, like, Frankly, one of the biggest myths that the music industry has created is the myth of like the singular auteur, you know, oh Mm -hmm. man, Taylor's just sitting there with her guitar and she comes up with this beautiful ballad or, oh, you know, Ed, Ed Sheeran is just there hanging out in the studio and man, he makes all these beautiful songs and that's just coming purely out of like. A, it's bullshit. That just does not happen. <laughs> like, that's not how, that's not how, especially like industry songwriting rooms go. But B, also, what strikes me, right, is that that is such an individualistic, modern, Western way to see creativity, mm. right? You look at heritage cultures, the world around. And it was never, hey, here's this singular genius that just creates beauty and the rest of us have no way to touch them and they're on just a completely different level, right? It's always been about communities, right? You even, you look 
in in Korean history, right? And Korean religion, you know, shamans and priests and medicine women and all of the midwives, all of these figures of wisdom and leadership, they always led and and created wisdom and transferred wisdom, not based on them being the individual genius of their tribe, but on them, but premised on them being rooted in their community. Right. Right. So that's why I love like when I'm when I'm creating, I love to surround myself with people who's th- this is kind of our our motto for our team is we want people with with great character and with great skill because mm. it's got to be both like right. the things that I'm trying to make, man, like, you know, this is really how I'm, my mama and my, my dad raised me was it doesn't matter how good this stuff is if the people aren't people that you can trust on like mm. a moral level, you know, and, and that's still kind of how I run my business is, you know, it doesn't matter how clouded up someone is. It doesn't matter how skilled someone is. It doesn't matter how many resources someone has. If the vibe check doesn't pass, if I can't trust that they're doing it for the right reasons, it's not going to be a good partnership. Uh, But vice versa, if I know that their skill is there, that their resources are there, and that these people are people who see the same world that I want to see. Those right. are the people I really like messing with because then I can trust we're trying to build something in the same direction. Um, so that's why, yeah, like shout outs to my co-writer, Lohi. Shout outs to, you know, my, my, my business team was in the room with us in these mm-hmm. uh, writing camps. Uh, Tin Hua Sha and, and Rob Shao, uh, we were all hanging out. And then an incredible team of producers. Uh, my LA team, Koei Beats, uh, freaking still on it and then Jonam and then uh my buddies my buddies in in New York Chucky Kim and Soundmaker like it really was a tribe like it really was a group effort of just wherever I went it was like yo let's get three or four of us in a room and let's see what we make and eventually some of those records wound up really saying what what I felt was the thing to say in this moment I, I really, really love that. I love it because I feel like I've been having this conversation a lot about what it means to really be in community. And I think we have this idea, especially during the pandemic, when a lot of people came to consciousness about their own identities and about what communities they're a part of and try to mm-hmm. find their place in those communities. There was this, I think, this pressure that we put on ourselves and that was also placed on us by other people who were already in community that you have to get along with everybody, that you had to go to all the events and show up in this way, and that, you know, you really had to be maybe something that you weren't. And uh. something that I've found for myself, at least, over this time, and, the, and a piece of advice I give, especially to other adoptees as they come into the adoptee community, is that while it's great to find this really large group of people who share this identity, who have a similar lived experience, and it, you can feel that pressure to want to do everything where you're really going to find like community and hit your stride is when you find your people within that larger group. Yes. And I think like when you are able to realize like, ah, oh, I don't necessarily vibe with everybody like and that's and that's OK. And then you realize, too, like people are going to move at different wavelengths. People are going to go and do things and have different perspectives than me. And that's OK. Like you're going to find not only your people, but you're going to find that step, that stride for yourself. And in that way, you're going to be able to start building the things that one work for you and two, like build into this larger community that you are a part of. And speaking of doing this work together with the people that make sense for you, you talk about truly inclusive AA and HPI community being something that needs to be addressed. And so what part of that conversation do you feel like, is there a specific piece of that conversation you feel like is missing that you hope the album in particular addresses or that you want to make sure that you are addressing moving forward as you talk about the album, promote the album, go on tour? Yeah, man, like you've heard me say this, which is I understand, but I also hate whenever people talk about 
breaking ground for ANHPI folks. Mm. Because my pet peeve is that so my pet peeve is is that so often we don't know our history and by gassing ourselves up like we're the first to do something, what we're actually doing is erasing all the people who've come before who did it mm. already and and just actually furthering the erasure of our ancestors. And that's really why this album is called what it's called. We were the seeds. Seeds come from somewhere, right? Now, it's great that we're the ones planted today and growing today and bearing fruit today. But at the same time, can we please acknowledge and dig into and do the work of understanding 170 years of Asian American history in this country? And you know, like, like I get it. I get it's a lot. It's it's so hard to get into when you're not taught it in middle school, high school. Like, I don't know, man. Like, when was did you did you Patrick did you ever have an Asian American teacher in 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 like school? No, I never had an Asian American teacher in school. Right, and and I know damn well that. My whole life, until I sought out Asian American studies, the only Asian American history I was taught my whole life was a short mention of like Chinese railroad workers, and then probably one paragraph, half a paragraph on Japanese American incarceration during World War II. And other than those two things, mm. where we grow up without being shown our ancestors, right? Like right. if you come from other communities, you're given all of these historical precedents. Here's a singer, here's an artist, here's a painter, here's an author, here's a politician, here's an activist. Asian Americans aren't given that. And I think because we're not given that, sometimes we can start thinking that it's not there for us to own. It's not there mm. for us to take. Right. And that's really what I want to enter this conversation with. Right. Because all this thing, all this that I'm talking about, about being rooted, about owning your heritage, about owning your history, knowing your ancestors, none of that happens if you don't think you have ancestors. None of that right. happens if you can't imagine that 50 years ago, 80 years ago, 120 years ago, there were women and men and other folks, non binary folks who, felt in society a lot of the ways that we feel mm. you know and uh and that's really the number one thing that i want to push our people to look for is instead of constantly feeling like we're breaking new ground and like we've got to be the first to you know participate in politics this way the first to stand up and write a rap this way we have this treasure trove of resources from our ancestors that we can pull from. But so often, some of us, and some communities are better at this, some communities are worse, but I would say many Asian American folks, you know, literally, I know for adoptees, right? For adoptees, so much of, of that history and that continuity was, was cut away at the, uh, at the uh, transnational moment, right? And so it's not our fault. It's no one's fault. Right. And, and I definitely don't want anyone listening to this to feel like I'm blaming them for not knowing their Asian American background and history and roots. Right. But what I am saying is that it's there for us if we're able to do the work and, and willing and, and ready to step out and start, you know, do a couple Googles, do a little, you know, right. TikTok exists. Like we can look it up now. But but like you pointed out too, there's there's avoidance and there's sometimes I know honestly for me, a lot of my life I didn't go into it, not because I didn't think there was something out there. I knew there was something there, but I just knew, like I said at the beginning, that if I get into this, it's gonna be a lot and it's gonna probably change the trajectory of my life. You right. know? Well, and you can't like you can't just toes in, half ass it, like, and then I'm I'm not gonna okay, that was cool, then I'm gonna go do this thing over here now. It's like I'm the same as you. If I'm going to do something, like I'm going 150%, and uh -huh. it probably is going to change my my life in some sort of almost tangible way. 
And like when I like had this moment of discovery of consciousness about my identity and not only as Asian, but as an adoptee, like it was full bore. Like I ain't got no time to go back into pre-consciousness. Like I got to learn, I got to do all of these things and could not agree with you more. I think I, and I appreciate the caveat of just that you're not blaming anybody. Like if they, if they have not yet sought out the history or or are even unaware that the history exists yet. Like if this is the first time you're hearing that, like don't blame you because it's hidden from us. Like it's been actively erased Mm -hmm. from our eyes by the powers that be because it's history that they don't want us to learn because when we learn it, it causes disruption and disruption causes the status quo to no longer be the status quo. Um, It causes us to gain power. You know, and it causes us to build community, build solidarity with other marginalized and historically marginalized identities and communities. And that's not good for people who who, um, have historically held on to power. And like once you know that that history is there, it does behoove us to start to learn, like to know and to to enter into those spaces and to become informed about what that is, because I totally agree at the end of the day. We don't need to continue to build anew. We need to build up off of the foundations that already exist. Like, let's be seeds and let's grow from the soil that has already been laid down in the Mm -hmm. fields, in, in, in the places that have already existed. Because when we keep trying to build new, we just build more floor. We just build more foundation. And while foundation is good, it doesn't, like, it's the, it feels like an illusion. An illusion yep. of progress, and because yep. new, new, new is new is exciting. It's fresh. It feels like okay, this is great, and you can rally behind it. But then, like you said, it perpetuates the erasure of the folks who have been doing the work, the folks that have come before us, and it we we do the work of erasure that's already being done. And so, if we can at least start to recognize, okay, that's what's happening, and there are all of these people that have been doing this. Like you said, you know, hundreds of years of history there for the taking there for us, for the, not even for the taking, for the claiming, for the reclamation Um, of, you know, we can, we can really start to build in a, in a, in a way that allows us to exceed any and all expectations that have been placed upon us by the, the systemic powers that already exist that, that try to box us in. Um, how do people within our diaspora, start addressing this. I think it's, it feels like you, you, you've given us a little taste of what that means. Like, it's like, it's, it's the Google it's starting to educate yourself, but is there any specific ways or pieces of advice you'd give to folks within our Asian American diaspora to really start to internalize this history and approach it maybe for the first time? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many great pieces of media out there, right? Um, whether that's uh, Asian Americans, right? This incredible documentary series uh, that PBS put out, uh, Renee Tejima Pena, um, who who directed it, uh, she's actually my mentor's cousin. So there's just this incredible breadth of knowledge out there, and it's available for free. You can just find that. Um, also, the Making of Asian America by Professor Erica Lee. That's one that I always point to. Um, but you know, like, like that's like I love these resources. They really help my consciousness raising. But what I would also point out is really get into community. Mm, you know, like okay. really get into community that has continuity with elders. You know, like some some of the communities that I look at that I'm super super proud to be around. There's this organization uh, that my mentor Diane Ujia, she's been the co-director for several years. Um, it's called API Rise. And it's a community, it's a nonprofit um, that helps folks who are Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, who have been impacted by the carceral system. Mm. So API Rise is this org where, you know, if you're Asian Pacific Islander and you've been inside or you are inside or your family's inside, you can go and you can connect with them and actually everything from helping people who are inside appeal and overturn cases or prove that they, you know, they, they've served their time and that they're ready to be an asset to their communities. 
all the way to when those people get out, getting them job placements, getting them training, you know, uh, avoiding going back inside, all of this incredible work. And it's rooted in, you know, leadership that's been doing this since the 70s, since the 80s. That's the stuff that's really powerful to me these days is mm. when we get an Asian American community, and I'm going to be real, I love my peers, I love you, I love so many of our friends, but that's not enough. You know, right. we need, I know, right, in the adoptee community, right, there's generations now of, right. you know, KADs. And so talking to the ones who are, you know, maybe a generation older than us and yep. saying, damn, like, when you were my age, how did you get through this? What was it like? What's the difference? How is it better now? How is it worse now? You know, we need that. We need to break out of just being around people. I'm going to be real, being around people who are just like us. Right. We need to be around people who get us and are kind of like us, but they, you know, like that intergenerational nuance has, mm -hmm. I think, really been lost and been stripped out by the way that modern media stratifies communities right everything from you know some people on facebook and some people on instagram and some people right. are on tiktok and it's very specific right if you're over 40 <laughs> you're probably here yeah and if you're like 40s 30s you're probably here and if you're gen z you're over here but that's never how community has flourished communities never flourish when we're stripped away from each other and right. when we're in our own echo chambers community always benefits and fertilizes each other when we can cross pollinate when we're all in the mix and sometimes that's confusing and sometimes that's not always super natural for us but that's how it's supposed to be i uh i don't know have you been watching uh or, or did you watch uh reservation dogs this series I've, I've by just uh, started it uh earlier this year i'm like i think i just finished season one so i'm getting ready to start season two see that is the best show on tv in the last 10 years i was just talking to my manager okay and he and i were both just like freaking complimenting the hell out of this show we it's it's one of the best because to me like it's the best depiction it doesn't just show you what a certain community is like it actually makes you kind of feel like a little bit of what it feels like to participate in that community right you know yeah. and and that's what I think we need more of. We need more community and less just like collections of people, you know, because right now every app, right? Freaking Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, X, whatever. Like they're all going to say, oh, we're sure to be a place for communities to meet. That's bullshit, right. man. That's not community. That's just a bunch of people yelling at each other behind like a profile picture. We need actual yeah. community. And that's where this Asian American thing, this Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander thing might actually have legs. A hundred percent. I freaking just resonating hard with everything that you said. And just like to go back to the history point of it, like if we're not connecting with those even one generation removed folks within our community, how are we going to know the history really? Like we can dive, like you said, we can dive into the, to, to Asian America, the PBS doc. We can dive into Eric Lee's making of Asian America, two resources that I really love. Like I'm a, I'm a person that likes to dive into the academic stuff, even though I, I dropped out of college. Like I'm not really like from the academic world, but for whatever reason, those are things that really like I like to dig into, but not everybody is like that. And those things aren't always accessible for some folks. Um, however, that kind of knowledge and history is accessible to us. If we're willing to take that step and have a conversation with the people from the different generations of our Facts. community. Facts. And, and I think not only does that extend to like a national, like, like, a like across the U S kind of level, but even especially at our local level, like if you can find your community locally, I think that's where you can really dive into what does it mean to be Asian American in Indiana? Like for me, what does it mean to be like, what's the history here? Because that's uh, history that you're not seeing in the textbooks. Like, even if you're learning about it in school, you're not learning what that means to be like how Asian America formed here, because quote unquote, what's the point to uh, quote other people from Indy who are like, well, there aren't any Asian people here, even though there are. And like, mm -hmm. we don't know that the earliest Asian people were here pre-exclusion. 
like there were Chinese folks that were here building businesses <laughs> on Indiana Avenue here in Indianapolis in 1873. Like, mm. why don't we know any of this history? And it's like, it's there for the reclaiming, but we have to be willing to go out and kind of ask those questions to the folks who have lived here and existed here in our community, who have been running these organizations since the seventies, the eighties, the sixties, whenever it might be. And if we have those conversations, you know, we have a better chance of, of rooting ourselves, of finding that rootedness in the community, which allows us to really start to internalize this knowledge and this community. And I think it's, it's important in a way that, we don't really often talk about because it is a lot easier to point somebody to a book or to a movie or to a show and say, well, here's your in. And it's a lot more difficult, sometimes even almost in a gatekeeper-ish way. I don't know if you've experienced that, but like to be like to share with a person, to share a person because people aren't resources, you know? And it's like, I don't want to just point somebody to Jason and be like, yeah, just hit up Jason and be like, take up all his time because your time is valuable. You got stuff going on. You're on tour right now. You got to go on tour for your album. So you don't necessarily have every moment of your day to be able to just sit and talk to everybody, you know, about some of these things. However, sometimes it is, it does behoove us to make those connections if we can, when we can, because again, it, it, it drives that deeper community. Um, what about folks outside of our Asian diaspora, of outside of Asian America? How did they make sure they're addressing this this lack of continuity within our community or lack of continuity within our history, this greater AANHPI history and community? Yeah, man. I think it's it's tough, right? Because as you mentioned earlier, we're at a time when th- this is the way I see it, right? Like the good people are sometimes scared to move cross-culturally mm. because we're afraid of appropriation, right? right. Bad people don't right. give a fuck about appropriation, right? They'll go no. wherever they want and take whatever they want. Yes. But the good-hearted people who care, sometimes we've worked ourselves into this position where it's counterproductive to solidarity because we think that sometimes our presence is unwelcome or we think mm. that sometimes just because it doesn't look like we belong or just because we don't come from somewhere that we're not allowed to learn and to listen and to support, you know, like the mutual liberation, the shared solidarity struggle of, of marginalized folks. Um, and I mean, I'd say do the same thing, man. Like, you know, like shit, like if, if you want to be down, man, find the people that, that are looking for people to be down, man. And and right. I'll always say, and this is something I learned from hip hop, man. Like I always felt welcomed in hip hop. You know, I was never trying to be black and I was never pretending to be black. And I was never like, you know, trying to, trying to supplant black voices in, 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 and, and black and brown voices in hip hop. But I just always came in and was welcomed in because I think, you know, I wanted to be down and I wanted to learn and I wanted to grow and, and people were down to lead me on that journey. You know, people who've been on that journey were farther on their journey than me. They were down to 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 welcome me in. And I think we need more of that on both sides, on the sides of communities. Mm. We we've been traumatized, we've been scared, we've been hurt by people who come in and they take, right? But as soon as we start thinking that the answer is then to only let in people who we feel like they belong or or they look like they belong. Then we've actually lost the greater battle, right? Because the greater battle, like freedom, self-determination, liberation is not going to be won by any one identity group on our own, right? right? It's not like the Asians or the Asians and the Pacific Islanders are going to unlock the key to being free of imperialism and wage slavery and all these terrible things. And we're going to get there on our own. Right. It's, it's not like we're going to figure it out and other people are going to steal it from us. The only way we're going to get there is together. And that's going to mm. require bilateral exchange. Mm. And, and that's why, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the people who benefit from the system not changing, they benefit from fragmenting us away from one another. Because when we say, hey, you know what? Everyone who's not like us, they might be here to culture vulture. They might be here to take from us. 
So it's safer when we're just us. When we're when it, when we're just us, that's actually when the battle's been lost already. Right. You know. So so I'd say to you know if folks are out there are listening are not from the Asian diaspora or not Asian Pacific Islander, um, it's come in, man. Like move move safe, move careful. You're in someone else's house. You know, move respectful, but. Please come in and learn because my life is not going to get better if you just stand over there and and, and don't come around and, and don't talk to us. Mm, I love that. I love that. I love the idea of bilateral exchange. I think that's super important. Thank you for naming that. And yes, like if we are siloed in our own spaces, like we've already lost. Like if, if, if at the end of the day, if we are only hanging out with each other, we have lost the battle, potentially the war. Um, the war against white supremacy, the war against oppression, the war against all of these terrible things. If we're only with each other, and it sounds almost backwards to say, but it is like if, if we're not moving together with all other peoples, like we we can't win because that's what they want okay. us to do. Like that's their that's the thought process behind it. If they can divide us, they can conquer us. That's the whole point of conquering. And. <laughs> yeah. Like, and yeah, so I just, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate what you do, not only with your advocacy and activism work, but what you do through the music. I think the music and creativity and, and entertainment is a way to help bridge a lot of these things that can feel, again, inaccessible to folks who may be coming and approaching these conversations for the first time. Like these are, again, certain ways that you can enter in to start diving deeper into history, into communal and community conversations that you might not even understand or realize exist right outside of your front door. And so I think what you're doing is really, really incredible. And as we wrap up here, I'm going to ask you a variation of my second to last question is instead of who are you currently learning from, um, which I would also love to know who are kind of the biggest influences for this particular album? Who did you really look wow. to as you were creating this to help create, we were the seeds and make it what it is right now. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Um, I mean, always like I'm always taking in a bunch of different stuff, but for, for this one, I'd say the artists that, because, you know, I listen to all kinds of stuff. And I think people are always super surprised when they hear what I've been listening to. Because a lot of what I listen to doesn't necessarily sound like what I put out. You know what I'm sure. saying? Like, you can enjoy stuff that sounds very different from what you make. But in terms of the kinds of artistic voices that I want to be slotted alongside, I, I'd say it's my top three, really, of all time musically are Kendrick Lamar, Yasin Bey, and and Bono from U2. Like okay. those three, I would say, are really the kinds of songwriting, the kinds of, you know, the the kinds of presence in the community, presence in the culture that I'd like to have. Um so yeah, those three, Kendrick Lamar, Yasin Bey, and and Bono from U2. I will say when I was listening to this album in particular, and when I've listened to your music in the past, but especially on this album, I could feel a lot of K dot influence in there hey, because fire. of the way that you structure some of uh, the way that you pull some of your rhyme schemes together. It feels non-conventional in a way that well, some people I feel like would be like, maybe that's not what I think of when I hear hip hop. And I'm like, mm. when I hear it, I'm like, that is what I think of because like, Kendrick is one of my favorites. Cole is one of my favorites, like right, especially right Definitely. now, or just lyricists. And I think that's the biggest difference that I hear in something like your music, because especially from another Asian American person doing something like this, it's just like I'm looking for the lyricism. And like it literally in your intro is we talk about that hard hitting lyricism. Like that's what it is. And so it it does not surprise me to hear that. Kendrick be one of those top influences. Yasin as well, 100%. Bono, though, was not expecting a Bono uh, influence right there. So nah, that's cool. Man, I like I'm that. Huge YouTube fan, man. And and their stuff has aged so well. You know, they're playing the the, the sphere in, in yeah. Vegas right now. It's crazy. That is. It's wild. It's wild. Um, all right. So, I Jason, I appreciate you giving me your time. 
going a little bit over our scheduled runtime for this conversation, but I think it was all necessary to be able to dive into some of these, you know, not difficult, but complex topics that actually at the end of the day really aren't that complex. Um, It's sit down, listen, learn, um, take the time to do a Google, to start educating yourself about not only your own community and culture, but the communities and cultures that exist outside of your own Um, and start to build that community and find your people within that community so you can start moving in the directions that you want to go and that we all need everyone to go. Um, Uh, Last but not least, you talked about you're getting ready to head out on tour. Where do folks get the album? How do we best support you as you move out here? How do we best support the album? What do we do to support you moving forward? Thank you, bro. Yeah, like uh, y'all can tap in on all my social media is at Jason Chill Music, at Jason CHU Music. Uh, so just, you know, whatever your platform of choice is, I'm there. And, uh, you know, reach out. <laughs> uh, the, the album is streaming everywhere. There's links on everything. Like, literally, you just search Jason Chu on on any place there's a search field. And and, and you'll call across me eventually. Um, got some music videos out. I'll be making the best place is to, yeah, just stay tapped in on my Instagram. I'll announce any upcoming shows there. And and really, please, if nothing else, um, I hope that this conversation spoke to y'all. And if it did, take a listen to the music and see if there's something in it for you. And if there is, I would I would love, love to hear that and, and talk with y'all. Bet, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, spitting game, giving us knowledge and, and dropping so many pieces of wisdom not only for myself, but for, for our audience here uh, at Conversation Piece. It really means a lot for you to give us your time and all of this energy and effort just to have this you know one-off conversation that we've had a bunch of times, but I know is really meaningful. It means a lot for the community that we're building here on the show. So it, it really means a lot. Thank you, man. Yes, sir. Thank you, bro. Absolutely. Um, for everybody out there, you can find all the links to We Were the Seeds, all of Jason's work, all of his social media stuff right here in the show notes. You can find us on Instagram at Conversation Pod Peace. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter. That's the best way to support me and support the show. And if you do feel so inclined to leave a rating or review wherever you get your podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. You can catch up on all of our previous episodes as well as reach out to me directly on our website, conversationpeacepod.com. And until next week, I am Patrick Armstrong, and this has been Conversation Peace. Thanks, Jason. Hey. Hey. Mama told me not to listen to rumors. I know how to groove when I step in the room. Daddy taught me to be quiet and honest. Don't talk about my progress, just speak with my moves. Mama told me not to listen to rumors. I know how to groove when I step in the room. Daddy taught me to be quiet and honest. Don't talk about my progress, just speak with my moves. Mama told me not to listen to rumors. Rooted deep, I ain't transplant Tattoos on my skin, they ain't hand stamps Taught lessons on my mentors So I make music, but not a band camp Sunset over the West End I'm in the West End Way back when they wouldn't let us in Now these Benjamins open the door Key quick as lightning Faces on them look like faces on them But I spent them up like changing places on them I know it ain't no grace of making money Just use it well before they take it from me I blew through the ceiling, I started the healing My therapist near me, I see him bi-weekly I look in the mirror, I like what I'm seeing I ain't gotta wait to represent on TV So does it dream that they never could give Loaded the bodies, ride deep on the ships Buried the bodies and burned up the records But songs in our memories never forget Mama tell me what you think to talk to you So just find me what you tell me Papa tell me what you think to talk to you You don't need to listen to the loop Mama tell me not to listen to rumors I know how to groove when I step in the room Daddy taught me to be quiet and honest Don't talk about my progress, just speak with my moves 小时候没什么影响但是的拼木全都是空空没想到我的祖辈跑过风扶地马拉松先蓝被切断历史和哲学为我都没流浪终于开始学习我家人的遗产一步一步是这么慢走一路顺风我住先告诉我这路好长我一